An official I talked to this morning said there is no movement of chemical weapons into Ukraine. At least they're not seeing the, the signs of it. The concern is that the Russians will seize one of these um, biomedical research facilities that Ukraine has where they do research on deadly pathogens like um, botulism and, and anthrax, seize one of those facilities, weaponize the pathogen, and then blame it on Ukraine and the U.S. because the U.S. has been providing support for some of the research being done in those facilities. It is 9 o'clock in Athens on this Tuesday morning. That makes it 9 o'clock in Kiev and 10 o'clock in Moscow. And I'm going to do an update on Russia and Ukraine. And we're also going to talk about uh, a law from the EU with regards to proof of work, mining and Bitcoin and central bank digital currencies. And it's actually some good news. And we're going to talk about that as well towards the end of the video. But first, let's talk about the, uh, the segment, the clip that uh, everyone just saw. And the, uh, the plan now, I guess, is that uh, the Russians, the narrative that's being uh, put forth now is that the Russians are going to seize these research facilities, not bioweapons, not biolabs. These are for research purposes, right? Research, just research. And, uh, but they do have dangerous pathogens. Before, they were just researching fertilizers and uh, chemicals for crops and for food. Now we are being uh, told that these facilities house dangerous pathogens. So anyway, the Russians are going to take over these, uh, these facilities. They're going to seize them. Then they're going to take those weapons and they're going to unleash them on the Ukraine people. And they're going to blame it on the Ukraine government and the U.S. That's the false flag coming from the Russian side. That is the narrative that we are being told. And I ask myself... Two questions, if this is the plan. Three, first of all, this is one hell of a complicated plan. God, is it a complicated plan? It is the stuff of movie scripts. I actually think there was a movie that was similar to something like this, kind of similar, which was like The Rock with Nicolas Cage and uh, Sean Connery, where uh, they go to Alcatraz, this military unit goes to Alcatraz, they seize these bio weapons and they want to unleash them on San Francisco. And just, okay, a fun plot for a movie. But uh, this plan that the Russians supposedly hatched is really, really complicated. Doesn't make much sense. But anyway, this is what we're being told to believe. And so um, when they do this, when the Russians unleash this, uh, this bio or chemical event and they blame Ukraine and uh, the U.S., I ask myself, why? Why do this? They want to manufacture consent for what? manufacture consent to gain the approval of the international community to uh to go into ukraine they've already gone into ukraine to uh to create moral outrage okay you want to create moral outrage you want to uh have the world say look uh look at what ukraine did is that the goal of this well if you're going to do that then it leads me to to another point that i have with this plan if you're going to do that then you work under the assumption that you're going to create all of this outrage uh, with this false flag and you're going to do it with soft power. Well, what soft power, what media power does Russia have at this point? They have RT broadcasting on BitChute, Odyssey and, uh, and Rumble. And that's about it. I mean, that's the extent of their international soft power at this moment in time. So you're going to create this, uh, this incident this chemical or bio incident, this false flag, and you're going to blame it on Ukraine and the United States. And you're going to somehow distribute this narrative or propagate this narrative using what tools? Using big tech? Big tech's going to amplify this, uh, this story? No. Uh, mainstream media is going to amplify this story? No. They're going to do the exact opposite. If, if Russia was going to do this and they were going to create this false flag, with the goal of manufacturing consent to do I don't know what. I mean, they're already winning the war. They've already uh, started the special operation, the war, the invasion, call it whatever you want in Ukraine. So they don't need permission for that. They're not going to accomplish anything on a financial or economic level with sanctions or a rollback of sanctions. So you're going to do this event. You're going to uh, blame it on Ukraine and Russia. 
I, I still don't understand what it gives you. What benefit does it give you? And then how are you going to get it out there? Because any event that, uh, that occurs in Ukraine at this moment, whether it's done by Russia, Ukraine, the U.S., uh, militias, military, Joe, John, Mary, doesn't matter. Anything that goes wrong in Ukraine at this moment will be blamed on Russia because the overwhelming soft media power is in the hands of the collective West. Period. So even if Russia was to do this false flag, you know what would happen? CNN, MSNBC, Facebook, Twitter, Google, everyone, every media outlet that the collective West owns and operates, which is 99% of them, they would say that this is a false flag from Russia. That's it. They would say that this is a false flag from Russia and everyone would believe it, right? Period. That would be it. So even if they create a false flag, all the media is going to do is say that Russia created a bio or chemical false flag. And that would be that. So I mean, they don't really accomplish anything with a false flag because no one's going to buy that Ukraine or the U.S. did it because all the media soft, soft power is with the collective West. All of it. Media, big tech, internet, all of it. I mean, what's Russia going to have? They're going to have RT saying that uh, Ukraine and the U.S. committed a, a bio or chemical attack on Ukraine, RT. That's it. And Sputnik News. There you go. That's going to be who's going to uh, propagate this Russian false flag. So it makes no sense. Any event, whether done by Russia, any chemical or bio event, whether it's done by Russia, Ukraine, or the U.S., or anybody else, will be blamed on Russia. And the media and the soft power of the collective West media apparatus and big tech, they are going to blame Russia as well. And they're going to amplify that blame. And they're going to push that blame in order to do what? Now, they, they do need to manufacture consent in order to get involved in the war, in order to escalate. So if there's a side that wants to manufacture consent to get involved in the conflict, it's not Russia. Russia's already involved. Whatever, whatever um, Russia's done, it's done. It's done it. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's undergone this, uh, this operation. It's decided to go through with this operation. It's received the, uh, the full force of, uh, of sanctions and condemnation from, uh, from the collective West at a level we've never seen in history. Um, it, it, it's done it. It's, it made the decision and it's living with its consequences, good or bad, right? So there's no reason to manufacture consent for anything at this moment in time. Now, the Jake Sullivans and the Newlands and the Blinkens, well, the neocons, the rhinos, the neolibs, well, they want to escalate. So they definitely want to manu manufacture consent. How do you manufacture consent? Well, you get people like Nikki Haley showing a photo of, of something happening in Duma, like we saw in Syria, to the UN, and you start to to get Ivanka Trump crying and, and all this stuff. We, we saw all of this back in, what, when was it? 2017, 2018? We've already seen this. We've seen this script play out. That's how you manufacture consent. And they have a reason to manufacture consent because they want to escalate. So for Blinken or for Newland to go through with a false flag, that makes sense because they have a certain goal that they want to achieve. They want to get more involved in the war. They want to escalate things. They want uh, the public to buy into their reasons for escalation, i.e. the Russians are barbarians, they're savage, they unleash this chemical attack or this bio attack on Ukrainians, so now we definitely have to get involved. So they want to manufacture consent, absolutely. The other thing is that they control all the soft power, all the media, all the big tech. So if there is a false flag, they're the, uh, they're the side that can get big tech and the media to say that Russia did it. And they're the ones that can amplify that narrative. Not the Russians, the Russians have no soft power, zero, zero at this point. So whatever false flags they decide to do, it's useless, it's useless. Because no one's gonna believe it, no one's gonna buy it. True, not true, whatever they do, whatever happens in Ukraine, um, good, bad, medium from Russia, it doesn't matter. Because very few people are going to uh, to buy into it. They're, 
you, you have no access for media on, uh, on, on the Russian side of things. It's been completely shut off. It's, com- been, uh, it's been completely shut down. So anyway, the whole thing doesn't make any freaking sense. There's no reason for Russia to do a false flag because it serves no purpose and, uh, and they don't have any, any way to distribute that narrative. But uh, the Blinkens and the Newlands and uh, the Sullivans, well, in my opinion, they have every reason to, uh, to do a false flag because it's, uh, it's going to manufacture the consent that they need from the public so that they can further escalate this conflict and, uh, and try to... Uh, Try to salvage something out of this because at the end of the day, Russia is, is, is winning this, this war, this operation, and, and they're looking for ways to, uh, to keep Russia bogged down. Remember, Russia's looking for ways to, to complete its, uh, its objective, demilitarization, denazification, and the West is looking for ways to keep Russia bogged down in some sort of prolonged insurgency. Their words, not mine. Prolonged insurgency. So... You know, and they have the soft power to propagate this. You know, they have all the tools at their disposal to uh, to create a false flag and to effectively blame it on uh, on the other side. That's just a fact. So it, it makes zero sense for Russia to even think about some sort of plan like that because it's uh, it's a no go. It's a no go, and it sounds very very complicated. Anyway, that's the situation with uh, with this. A little a little bit longer i think than i wanted to talk about this but anyway i want to pull up an article now because we have the uh an excerpt from an article which i did manage to find from sputnik news and it's so hard to get information from from the russian side of things at this point in time i mean you're talking about a complete media blackout um but anyway you had jake sullivan meeting with uh his chinese counterpart in rome and according to the uh the collective West, the U.S. mainstream media, and according to Jake Sullivan, the reason for this meeting is to send a warning to China not to help Russia in the uh, in the conflict in Ukraine. And we have some more information, actually, with regards to these weapons that uh, that Sullivan floated out. And uh, coincidentally, all of the mainstream media outlets picked up like instant, instantly, instantly, like 10 seconds apart. They had these stories out there, which means they were already scripted and ready and waiting. They just needed uh, the okay from uh, Sullivan to uh, publish. But um, <clears throat> I need some water. But um, Sullivan, uh, Bloomberg actually, Bloomberg shed some light as to uh, what Sullivan was talking about, or allegedly the claims that Sullivan made. And Bloomberg says that these weapons that Russia was asking China to, uh, to deliver were, uh, were drones and some other intelligence gathering uh, equipment. So we have some more specific information as to what Russia may have been asking China. Keep in mind, Russia denies these claims and China denies these claims. But if they're true, we know that Russia may have gone to the Chinese, according to Sullivan, and asked for drones and for other intelligence gathering equipment. And even more specific, these, uh, this request from Russia, according to Sullivan and, uh, and the US, this request was made towards the end of February. So this request was made, if you believe Sullivan's side of the story, this request was made at the beginning of the, uh, of the operation in Ukraine. So it wasn't made yesterday, it wasn't made now, according to Bloomberg and their sources from uh, the Sullivan, from the U.S. side of things, say that these claim, the, the, this request was made in, uh, towards the end of February, which puts it at about the time that the, uh, the operation, the invasion, the war, the conflict, whatever you want to call it, uh, started up. So that's, uh, we have some more information there. Could be true. Could be true. I could see Russia going to China and saying, you know, I mean, they were definitely coordinating on all of this. There's no doubt about that. Everything was coordinated, I believe, between Moscow and Beijing, my opinion. I think they were coordinating all their moves, economic, financial, military, everything. Um, I, I wouldn't shock me if, if Russia said, hey, can you guys deliver some drones and some uh, intelligence gathering stuff to us? That wouldn't shock me. But I don't think that's the reason that Sullivan is uh, meeting with China. I think that's the excuse. 
I think that, I, to me, I think that is just the cover. The real reason I think Ch Sullivan is meeting with China and that he's so panicked about China right now and making threats that China's going to pay a heavy price if it helps Russia is because, uh, well, I'm going to read you why. It's because China is, uh, is actively working with Russia to de-dollarize. And we have this report coming from Yerevan, March 14th, via Sputnik News. The member states of the Eurasian Economic Union, the EAEU, and China will develop a project for an independent international monetary and financial system. This was agreed upon by the participants in the economic dialogue, a, state, a new stage of monetary, financial, and economic cooperation between the EAEU and the PRC, Global Transformations, Challenges, and Solutions, which was held on March 11th via video conference. It is envisioned that the system will be based on a new international currency, which will be calculated as an index of the national currencies of the participating countries and commodity prices. The first draft will be submitted for discussion by the end of March. Sergei Glaziev, Minister of Integration and Macroeconomics of the EEC, emphasized China was the first in the world to move to the stage of national economic recovery, economic sovereignty. In other words, de-dollarization. You get it? So all the, the former Soviet countries, what people call the CIS, or the, uh, the Eurasian Economic uh, Union, right? All of these countries, along with China, are working to transact outside of the dollar, right? We're looking at five, six, seven countries now, and more countries are going to follow. I, uh, I read in the article that Cuba is uh, at these events as an observer, and other countries are there observing, which means if they're observing, I think Iran was also on that list, so if they're observing, that means they're, they're on the sidelines waiting to be invited in to this new uh, currency, basket of currency, reserve currency. This is why Sullivan, in my opinion, is in China. And this is why his warnings are so strong that, uh, that China is going to pay a heavy price if it delivers drones and intelligence gathering equipment to Russia. Who cares? That's meaningless. Turkey's delivering drones to Ukraine every day. And, and Russia is speaking with Turkey and there's no, I mean, Russia's pissed off with Erdogan, but, you know, this is not like a huge deal. It's not going to change the, uh, the dynamics of the, of the conflict. Chinese drones are not going to change the dynamics of the conflict. But what Jake Sullivan is, is scared to death of is uh, the accelerated pace of de-dollarization and how China is taking a central role in the de-dollarization. You know, this is... This is big stuff. This is big stuff. And you can't find this anywhere unless you go to Russian media. You can't get to Russian media because it's freaking blacked out everywhere. But uh, that's, that's what I believe is the purpose of Sullivan's meeting. And these threats are, are being made against China because the U.S. is scared to death that uh, once China really, really pushes hard to de-dollarize, well, then the whole house of cards completely falls apart. So that's my take on that. Um, a quick update as to what's going on on the ground in, um, in Ukraine. Uh, look, Mariupol, from what I understand, is uh, at the point, at the level that uh, it's going to be captured. Like I said, it's, it's day to day. Um, the Russians are, they have, actually, we have confirmation that the Russian forces have cleared out much of the outskirts and the suburbs of the city. And now they're going to move into the center of the city. And that's the, that's the last part. Uh, the east, you know, the war in the east is is settled. The the cauldrons are are uh, have been formed. Um, you know, the, I'm getting a lot of reports that the Ukraine military they can't get supplies in, they can't get fuel and oil, um, anything that they need to continue the the fight, they can't get it. There was a a missile that was launched in Donetsk and killed 20 civilians. It was launched into a civilian area and killed 20 civilians. The Western mainstream media doesn't report on that at all. Once again, it goes back to the false flag thing that they're saying. You see, anything that happens to the people of Donetsk and Lugansk, the mainstream media is not going to talk about it. But, you know, anything that's happening to the Zelensky regime, well, they're going to amplify it. It, it just goes back to the point that I was making at the beginning of the video. Um, if you wanted to learn about what happened in Donetsk and the 20 civilians that were killed from civilians, civilians, everybody that were killed from the, the missile, 
from the Ukraine side of things. You, well, most people won't even know that. They'll, they won't know that this happened. Anyway, um, you know, that military in the east, the Ukraine military, the Azov guys, some the best Azov fighters, they're, they're, uh, it's just a matter of days. They're surrounded. It's just a matter of days before um, that operation comes to, comes to a close in the east. And then you get to the million-dollar question. What, uh, what does Russia do next? You have reports that there was, uh, there was heavy uh, bombing or fighting in Kharkiv and Kiev, though I just don't know. I mean, once again, um, you're getting this from like Fox News. But you don't know. It, it, it's hard to say. I, we do know that uh, Putin did give orders to the Russian military not to take the cities. So now we have confirmation from the highest source from Vladimir Putin that he specifically told the military not to enter the uh, the main cities, which proves our our analysis at the start of this conflict that Russia does not want to uh, to destroy Ukraine. They want to capture Ukraine. They're tiptoeing into this, or as Scott Ritter said, they're going soft with uh, with this invasion, this operation, and uh, we have confirmation of that now. So. I don't know. I don't know what Russia is going to do now as they wrap up the operations in the east. What are they going to do now with uh, with Kiev? And what are they going to do further west of Kiev? I don't know. I think personally, I think they want a, uh, a diplomatic solution. I think once they solidify their situation in the east, and that may include Odessa, even though Odessa is further west, it may include Odessa. I, it's hard to say. Um, I know there is a cauldron and encirclement in Odessa that is happening. But uh, once that that's completed, I believe that the Russians are going to push hard for a diplomatic solution. And we'll see. So I, I don't know what's going to happen, but let's take it one day at a time and see what happens in the east and see when that wraps up what, uh, what the next uh, play will be. I believe there'll be a lot of diplomacy once that wraps up and hopefully... Zelensky uh, comes to his senses and we end this thing. We end this thing, i.e. Ukraine is not in NATO. Put that in writing, solidify that, codify that, recognize Crimea, recognize Donetsk, Lugansk, and uh, demilitarize. Never have military in, U in Ukraine. Just make it a neutral, peaceful place. No military, nothing. Just neutral. Just make it freaking neutral. Um, hopefully that's the outcome, but let's see. Let's take it one day at a time and uh, see. Let's hope this this conflict wraps up. So uh, the final thing I want to talk about is the MICA law, the markets in crypto assets from the EU. And it's kind of related to this if you if you go by the 20, 2030 agenda, or what I like to say now is the 2025 agenda, because it seems like it's been accelerated and the push for central uh, bank digital currencies and all that stuff. Well, the EU wanted to pass a law that was going to ban proof of work mining, i.e. energy intensive mining of crypto. And that would have affected Bitcoin and Ethereum for now. Ethereum's going to change to, to proof of, uh, of, of, uh, of um, stake instead of proof of work. I forgot, proof of stake instead of proof of work. And uh, so Ethereum is making a transition, but it would have affected Bitcoin, uh, Zcash, and some other cryptocurrencies that use what uh, many climate change activists consider very energy intensive ways to... Uh, to secure and to and, and to verify and to safeguard the blockchain. Um, so this law, this MICA law, as it was called, Markets and Crypto Assets, was put for a vote in the European Union, and it failed. It did not pass, and that's good news. So it did not pass. I think the vote was something like 34 against 26. The parties that voted for the banning of uh, proof of work, uh, Bitcoin mining, were of course like the Greens and these types of parties. But then you had a coalition of other parties that said, no, no, we're not going to ban this. And uh, that's good news because, in my opinion, it, uh, it slows down the push for a central bank digital currency. Because once you can ban Bitcoin and proof of work, then you know the next regulation that's going to come is going to be banning uh, proof of stake and other crypto assets. And so, you know, they work step by step. And... Uh, once they ban all crypto assets in the EU, well, then they could uh, monopolize the um, they can monopolize the space with a central bank digital currency, which is essentially our uh, locks us in 
locks us into to an existence of uh, of slavery and servitude. And uh, this has now um, this has now been uh, been voted down for now, and that's a good thing. They can the Greens and these parties can still work to uh, to veto the existing MICA law, which does not have the ban of uh, proof of work mining in it, and they can look to veto it and then send it back and revote it, but. For the time being, it looks like uh, this legislation to ban proof of work crypto and to accelerate what would be the introduction of central bank digital currencies has failed, and that's a good thing. And uh, and that's some good news, uh, very good news. So uh, I just thought I would bring that up because I think it's an important story. Anyway, everybody, that is the video coming to you from Athens. Kind of a long video, but we had a lot of uh, a lot of interesting topics to discuss. So uh, the Duran.locals.com, check out Alexander's channel, check out the Duran's channel, and uh, definitely the Duran.locals.com. Take care, everybody. Mm -hmm.